The Egg and I, Part 5, Autumn, opening with a quote from Hood, which reads, I saw old autumn in the misty morn, stand shadowless like silence, listening to silence. Chapter 19, And Not a Drop to Drink. The well at the back of the place dried up during the spring. The spring at the foot of the orchard disappeared during the summer, and we carried August's and September's water from a spring in a valley 1,800 feet from the house if we cut across the burn a mile and a half by road. I was really glad when the spring dried up, for it meant that Bob hauled the water in the truck in 10-gallon cans and I didn't have to feel guilty if he caught me washing my face more than twice a day. Bob was so parsimonious with the water when he was carrying it that one would have thought we had pitched camp in a dry coulee instead of being permanently settled in the wettest country in the world outside of the Canadian Muskeg. I have to have more water, was my perpetual cry. More water, Bob would shout. More water, I just carried up two buckets. I know you did, I would explain patiently. Two buckets equal 20 quarts. 20 quarts equal five gallons. And the stove reservoir holds five gallons. In addition to filling the reservoir, I made coffee and boiled you two eggs, made cereal for the baby, and wet my parched lips twice. The water's gone. With set mouth, Bob would go down through the orchard and dip out two more buckets. These would see me through the first tub of baby's washing. There were still the rinsings, the baby's bath, the lunch and tea, the lunch and dishes, the floor scrubbing, the canning, the dinner and the dinner dishes, not to mention occasional hair washings, baths, and face washing. For these, I carried the water from the spring myself. It was so much easier than explaining. I estimated that I carried a minimum of 16 buckets of water a day, 16 10-quart buckets and 160 quarts a day for about 360 days. Is it surprising that my hands were almost dragging on the ground and my shoulders sagged at the sight of anything wet? that I was tortured by mirages of gushing faucets and flushing toilets. I could not believe it when Bob announced casually one fall morning, I'm going to start laying the pipe for the water system tomorrow. He had been plotting the course, tiling the spring, and ordering equipment for a long time now. But none of it had been definite enough to bring running water out of the Mirage Department, but pipe laying was different. Each day, I could actually watch the water being brought nearer and nearer the house, foot by foot. Then the 600-gallon water tank arrived, knocked down, and looking disappointingly like a bundle of faggots. Bob spent a day out in the woods locating four poles, straight, clearing approximately 18 inches at the butt end to support the platform for the tank. I scanned the bathroom fixture section of the catalogs, and Bob decided that the bathroom would have to go where my rhododendrons, sans tap roots, were thriving. Did I care? Not a whit. I jerked them up and put them by the woodshed. We were all out for water. Fall was a wonderful time in the mountains. The sun got up at six, but languorously, without any of her summer fire, and stayed shrouded with sleep until about nine. She shone warmly and brightly then, but I knew it wasn't summer because, though the earth was still warm and the squashes were blossoming, when I looked heavenward, I saw the tops of the trees swimming filmily in mists, and the big burn smoked and smoldered 
with rising fog until noon. Fall and school were still closely linked in my mind, and I can almost feel the pinch of new school shoes when I saw the first red leaf, heard the first hoarse shouts of foghorns. I remembered last fall when we had driven along a valley road one morning early and had seen the children scrubbed and clutching their lunch boxes, waiting at each gate for the school bus. I wondered if we would still be on the ranch when Anne started the school. I thought, what a long day 8 o'clock to 4.30 must be for six-year-old first graders. While I was absorbed in such reverie one morning, Bob shouted that the water tower was finished, except for the water. To the casual outside eye, it was just a very sturdy, well-constructed platform on which rested a round wooden water tank. To me, it was lovelier than the Taj Mahal. Bob shouted down from the high platform, I feel like running up an American flag. I was so excited that I decided to go down and tell Mrs. Kettle about it. In the baby buggy, I put Anne, a bucket of extra eggs, and a half a chocolate cake. And with sport and the puppy racing fore and aft, we started down. It was a delightful walk, and our cheeks were rosy and our spirits high as we trundled up the last lap to the kettle's porch. I was startled out of my intent maneuvering of the buggy wheels around axles, stray fenders, car parts, and tools by a terrified roar from Paw Kettle in the barnyard. I turned just in time to see him streak out of the milk house into the barn and to see the water tower which was on a platform about 30 feet high and supported by four straddled spindly legs, give a great groan and collapse with a splintering crash on the milk house roof. A geyser of water flooded the barnyard and frightened an old Chester White sow and her pigs so that they went right through the discarded bed spring, which was part of the barnyard fence, and disappeared into the oat field. After a time, things quieted down and Pa came sidling cautiously out of the barn and Elwyn called from under his car. Hey, Pa, you dropped something. Ha, ha, ha. Ma shuffled down from the back porch. For a while, they stood and looked. Then Pa was stupid. Bugger almost got me. It almost got me, Ma said. For Christ's sake, what happened? Mr. Kettle looked belligerently at the hole in the milk house roof and at the shattered tank. All I wanted was a little piece of two by four. And I know the bugger would collapse. Mrs. Kettle said, Pa, what was you doing? Mr. Kettle said, I need a little piece of two by four for the apple bin. And I thought the other leg could hold her all right. Only took a little piece about f foot long from that leg by the milk house. Ma said, well, I'll be goddamned. It was only a little piece you took out of the water tank support. What the hell do you think would hold it up? Air? She stared it back toward the house. I went with her. We left Pa still muttering. It was only about a foot long. Only a little piece. Elwin was crowing delightedly. I know what happened when I see the old fool saw it. Ha, 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 ha. The next morning, before seven, Mr. Kettle was at the back door. I heard you wasn't falling a water system, he said as he scrambled off his wagon and adroitly intercepted Bob's intended escape through the orchard. And I wonder if perhaps you have a few hundred feet of old pipe you wasn't come to use. Thumb extra fittings or thumb lumber. Preferably for... 30-foot 4 by 4s to support a new water tower. And then I wondered if you could spare me a few days with the hang. We're awful late this year, but the boys won't help and Ma and I can do it alone. Bob said rather sharply, Of course, I don't have any extra pipe. It was difficult enough to scrape together the money for the 1,800 feet we have to have. And how can I help you with the haying when I have almost a quarter of a mile of pipe to bury? Pa, not at all nonplussed, thought this over for a moment and said, 
Well, I'll tell you, Bob, the cream check was pretty small this month. I just thought that perhaps you had some old pipe. Perhaps you ordered too much. I wanted to see what I wasted when I got good use for it. Bob walked away in disgust. But Mr. Kettle didn't seem to mind and waved cheerfully to me as he drove out of the yard. I knew that he would be up the next day for something else. The pipe bearing progressed so slowly that Bob finally had to hire help. Jeff, the moonshiner, sent up a good customer of his who was temporarily out of work. Good customer was a fine worker and an appreciative eater but he was very fat and each day after lunch he settled himself in the kitchen rocker, spread a newspaper over his lap, unbuttoned his trousers and fell into a heavy sleep. Of course, he was entitled to his lunch hour. He had a right to be comfortable and he tried to be modest, but I felt that that open fly was a slap at my dignity. I spoke to Bob, but he thought it very amusing and said that we were lucky to get good customer, buttoned or unbuttoned. I felt the same way before long, for Bob became ill. It was our first bout with illness of any kind outside of bear clawings, smashed toes, and other ordinary mishaps. And it was sudden. One morning when the alarm went off, Bob said thickly, I can't get up. I'd be sick. And there it was. Bob was ill. With anyone else, it would have been the common cold. With Bob, it was a little known, very serious illness for which he chose to direct treatment. His pillows were in wads just behind his neck so that his chin was on his chest and his cough sounded much worse than it was. He wouldn't read, preferring to snuffle and stare moodily out the window. He made me take his temperature, which soared to 99 degrees, hourly and howled with pain when I forced nose drops up his quivering nostrils. His throat was very sore, he said, and it should have been bleeding from calling to me. The second night he was in bed, Jeff brought him a gallon of whiskey and clam-faced gia duck and crowbar a quart each. Whiskey, they told me as they poured themselves large slugs, will cure anything. If, I thought, it will cure a strong leaning toward homicide, I will drink a pint. Neat. Bob was in bed a week, and good customer was so kind, so helpful during that week, that by the second day, if he had elected to go around stark naked, I wouldn't have cared at all. He chopped me so much fine dry kindling and stacked it in the entryway so conveniently that I had stove hot, really hot, from 4.30 until 10 at night. He not only drove the truck to the valley and brought me up as much water as I can use, but he filled and emptied the wash tubs and carried the clothes basket out to the clothesline for me. He fed the ducks, the pigs, and the turkeys, which we had recently acquired and were fattening. And then he built a sandbox for the baby and drove clear to Docktown Bay for fine white sand to fill it. When good customer first came, I used to sit at the table, my stomach rigid with disgust, as I watched him shovel in his food and knew that he would soon be sprawled in the rocking chair, unbuttoned and unlovely. During that week, when Bob was ill, I used to sit at the lunch table, soggy with sentiment, and watch him shovel in his food and wonder why such a divine creature had never married. I asked him at last. He said, Lady, I never married because I don't like women. Women drive me crazy. They got no organization, and they go puttering around and never get nothing done. Deliver me from having one around all the time. I was very hurt. And it didn't help to hear Bob's hoarse laughter come booming out from the bedroom where he had been listening. At last, the pipe was all buried, the engine was started, and one bright fall morning I heard the musical splash and gulp of water being pumped into the tank. The tank was then scrubbed and drained and at last filled, 
and I stood underneath it and said a little prayer and then went into the kitchen to find that the faucet in the sink had been turned on and the water was an inch deep all over the floor. I didn't care. It was in the house. The next day, I walked down to tell Mrs. Kettle about the water and to find out how she had been making out since the collapse of the water tower. What they were doing for water was evident long before I reached the house. For sitting on an ordinary kitchen stepladder at the side of the old tower was a 50-gallon wooden barrel into which the ram was busily pumping about 50,000 gallons of water. The barnyard was awash, and a white pecan duck and her goslings were paddling in and out of the tool house. The old sow, which had disappeared into the oat field the day of the crash, had made a lovely wallow just outside the milk house door, and little waves laughed against the old wagon and discovered furniture as she shifted her weight from side to side. Mrs. Kettle was futilely sweeping mud out of the milk house door. But every time the old sow or one of her children moved, a fresh wave washed in. I called to her from the edge of the flood, and she stopped sweeping long enough to call out, There's some pitch in the wood box. Put the coffee pot on and I'll be right up. When she finally came in, flushed and discouraged, she said, You know that mess down there is only one of the thousands I've been in ever since I met Pa. He's good and all that, but he ain't got system. Which was where she was wrong, of course, for Pa had the perfect system for getting out of any and all work. I hadn't the heart to mention our running water. It was late October. I awoke one night to the great whooshing of the wind through the forest, which meant a storm was gathering. I felt the house give a convulsive shudder as the wind slammed its shutters and rattled the chimneys. The clock ticked loudly. Tick, 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 tick. I thought, this winter storm that's coming. Soon it will be winter. A long, dreary, gray, wet, lonely winter. The wind gave a derisive howl and dove headlong into the burn to worry the frail old snags. A few drops of rain fell. I felt the tremendous depression settle over me like a sodden comforter. Then from the kitchen, I heard a small noise. It was a gentle little sound, but it had penetration and rhythm, and soon I can hear it above the storm, above the clock, above the nervous rattling of the house. It was the friendly split, splat, split of a dripping faucet, our kitchen faucet. That was it. I had water. I had almost forgotten. The water prospects brightened. Soon I was asleep, lulled and quieted by that supposedly nerve-wracking sound, a dripping faucet.